My name is David Burnell. Really glad to have you here today. I'm doing this podcast as a follow-up to the live online seminar we did on go bags and 72-hour kits. The seminar featured a checklist, which is fairly comprehensive, that can be downloaded at davidburnell.com. The checklist inside of it contains the, the content of the kits that I used to carry on many of my missions around the globe. You know, I spent time in Japan after the earthquake and tsunami recovering bodies, in Burma with the Karen army in a very remote jungle area just outside of Thailand, in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, many, many other places, Haiti after the quake. And I was allotted only about 40 pounds of gear when I went to Haiti, and I had a rifle and a handgun, and I had to carry everything else in that weight limit. So it caused me to really drill down what was essential and what was not. And so these kits that we're going to talk about reflect that. Some of the considerations are that there's the, some of the considerations are that there might be three different categories that we need to consider to have in what we would call a kit. The first is an everyday carry kit. That's what's on your body when you get up and go to work every single day. The items that I have in this list is gun, knife, light, and basic first aid. The second kit is a car emergency kit. And inside of here, I flag one of the most important items as a pair of tennis shoes. A lot of times women, when they go to work, they wear comfortable shoes or high heels or something that would not allow them to travel long, long distances or to be able to move quickly with those types of shoes. So having a pair of tennis shoes in the trunk of your car might be really important if a freeway gets shut down or there's a national disaster while you're at work and you have to move from your car to another location. The third kit is the 72-hour kit or what we affectionately in the military call a go bag or a bug out bag. It's basically a single contained bag that has all of the elements in that you would need to live and survive for up to three days. What kind of a bag do we use for this kit? What do we store our stuff inside of? I like to use waterproof bags, whether it's a backpack or just a waterproof bag with handles or shoulder straps. Something that keeps the elements out of the bag is critical. If you don't have that, you can use a five gallon bucket that is normally used to store wheat or rice and put your stuff in there and seal it and write the name of whoever's 72 hour kit on the outside of that thing. One of the benefits of that is that you can sit on those. So it's a nice item to have when you are in a primitive location. If you have just a regular backpack, I wouldn't get you wrapped up in the type of backpack or anything, as long as it fits everything that you have. I would make sure that I put everything that's going inside of it, if it's not waterproof, inside of a waterproof bag, whether it's a trash bag or an actual waterproof bag. And that way, if it rains or you're in rough weather, which most of the time, if you're relocating in a disaster, it most likely might have adverse weather, that would make sure that everything else inside is preserved and you open up your backpack, pull it all out, get to it, put it back in your waterproof container and store it back in your backpack. You know, emergencies can be broken down into a couple of different principles. One of the principles that is really critical is to ask a question when something happens. Do I stay where I'm at or do I go to an alternate location? Sometimes we're going to be required to move from one location to another because the area we've been living in has become compromised. Because of that, we grab our 70 char kit and then we move to a new location, a safer place. Sometimes in an emergency when we have our 70 char kit, you might be required to stay longer than three days. So a disaster kit is designed, or a 72 hour kit, to generate a collection of items that's based upon what you need to sustain yourself and or family members in the event of emergency. A survival kit is different than that. And there's some confusion, I think, in the world about survival kits versus 72-hour kits. What I'd like to say about this is that a survival kit fits inside your 72-hour kit. It's a smaller kit. I keep my survival kits in a little butt pack and it goes inside my 72-hour kit or if there's not enough room, I clip it around the outside of it and it can be removed and put on my waist in the event that I need to have just that kit with me. What goes inside a survival kit is the stuff that would 
lets you survive in an austere environment where you need to make fire, purify water, and have just the basic fundamental essentials, a little pocket knife, some basic, basic items. Only the things that are really essential. The survival kit the United States Air Force recommends has basically just 10 items in it. Those 10 items are a large knife or a machete, a cell phone, a lighter, a ten, a, about a 10 by 10 plastic tarp, Mylar survival blanket, a mini LED flashlight, water purification tablets, water containers of some sort, a small roll of fishing line and dental or dental floss. I would add, throw a couple hooks in there. You can catch not only fish, but fowl, which are birds with hooks and bait as well. And a $50 bill. Why starve when you can buy a meal? So that's the basic thing that the Air Force recommends in their survival kit, their top 10 items. Um, yours is going to vary depending on what your needs are. You might actually be in an urban setting. And that urban setting might be at a gymnasium or a park or a church or someplace you've been relocated to. So some of the comforts of home can be brought with you in that 72-hour kit to help life become a little bit better. And there's no reason to suffer because you've been relocated. The key categories for any kit are going to be really drilled down into about five or six different large categories. The first one is water. We can live about three days without water, plus or minus, depending on your health, your size, how much exertion. Food. We can live about three weeks without food. Again, variable depending on many factors, but that's the basic ballpark number. Before that, we got oxygen, of course, which about three minutes without oxygen. So oxygen, three minutes, water, three days, food, three weeks. Those are kind of the parameters, the baselines for survival without the, these essentials. Clothing is the fourth item. Water, food, shelter, and then clothing. Clothing becomes our mobile shelter. It becomes our mobile tent. It becomes the barrier between us and the elements. You know, on several of my missions and in the military, on military operations, whether it was on a flight line or out in the middle of nowhere in a desert or in the jungle, oftentimes all I would have on me to be in an expedient shelter was my Gore-Tex jacket or a poncho. That's what I would sleep under, live under, eat under for many, many hours and sometimes many, many days. So our clothing, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in some detail about the layers of clothing and what we might want to consider. The fifth item on this major category for any kit is first aid. And again, I have a nice list that I'll present there. The sixth and final item are the essentials. So let's start, first of all, with water. Water, one gallon per person per day is the recommendation. It's used for drinking and sanitation. It's important to have water purification capability with you. That can come in the form of tablets or water filtration systems. I have a couple of different filtration systems that actually adapt to the bottle that I carry so that when you are pumping water out of a contaminated source like a river or a stream, that nothing touches the bottle and the lip of the bottle where you might put your mouth because the filtration system adapts to the bottle. Those are kind of nice, a little bit more expensive, but they make filtering water really great. You can also buy water bottles that have filtration straws in them. So there's a lot of options out there, but it'd be nice to have one of those in your 72-hour kit to purify water should the need arise. The final way to purify water, of course, is to bring your water to a rolling boil for several minutes. This is what we did in Burma. Every morning, we would have our water boiled, and we would put it in our carrying devices, whatever that might be, with us throughout the day so that the water was clean. The definition for boiled water and purified water that in that method is called distilled water. The second category, food. At least a three-day supply of non-perishable food. It's important to select foods that require no refrigeration, preparation, or cooking, little water, or no water. And choose foods that you'll eat, or your kids will eat, or your family will eat. Some foods that are out there are meals ready to eat from the military. Those are fantastic. They have, they're high in calories and energy, and they have a, a nice variety of items inside the packets 
which are good because you can spread those out over even a longer period of time. I know in Haiti, when I was there after the quake and the earthquake, uh, providing security to doctors and nurses, I was getting one MRE a day. And that was nice because I wished it was two, but it was nice because I could take the crackers or um, other elements of that meal and save them for different portions of the day and eat the main meal, perhaps for my main meal. I like the athletic protein bars. I carry those on missions wherever I go. They're easy to eat, don't require any preparation, and they're high in energy. Fat content in your food is important, especially when you're in a survival situation because your body lives off of fat, and fat is important for you to maintain a healthy and a disease-free body. So those are some considerations on the food side. Shelter, the third area of our large category list that should be in every kit. I actually have a small tent for my wife and I that I would put inside my car should I have to go from my primary location to another location. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable. Bedding. I have a couple sleeping bags I throw in the car. Ground cloth, such as a tarp or a poncho or a plastic sheet, also can be used to build a shelter. Blankets. If you're going to bring blankets, what I recommend you do, you should get wool blankets. Wool maintains its property of warmth even when it's wet because it creates a barrier between your skin and the elements. It also has the ability to dry out very rapidly and can be shaken and much of the water can be displaced by shaking the wool. This is why in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, these northern climates, you'll see a lot of wool in the people that live there. A cloth sheet. You know, cloth sheets can never be uh, understated. I sleep often in the field with just a, a, a sheet that is the top layer sheet that normally goes on a bed. Very comfortable, and if you sleep hot like I do, it's a great cover and barrier for you to have some element of warmth but not get overheated. It does stop some mosquitoes, but they have a tendency to burn right through them in my experience. So mosquito netting might be another consideration. Duct tape, always important for building shelters or repairing gear, but it's part of the shelter category of product that I would have inside my go bag. 550 cord. 550 cord is from the military. It's used for parachute rigging, and it is the strands of cord that extends from the parachute down to the operator who's wearing the chute and has deployed his chute. There are several cords on a parachute, and inside each cord there are small filaments. These small individual cords in and of themselves are extremely strong, but when combined with the sheath of the 550 cord, it provides 550 pounds of tensile strength each 550 cord segment. I would put a couple hundred feet of 550 cord inside your go bag and under the category of sheltering. Many other uses for this though. Sometimes we used to take 550 cord and lace up our boots with it so that in the event of emergency, you could take the 550 cord, strip out the internal filaments and relace your boots up with the sheath of the 550 cord and still have a very strong shoelace. And now you have the 550 cord filaments from the inside to make fishing lines, to lash items, uh, for clothes lines, uh, for snaring, or any other application that you might come up with. The other ele element I'd put in a shelter uh, kit would be emergency heating blankets that keep in warmth. Some of these are very inexpensive. Uh, some of them can be a little bit thicker and a little bit bigger, but those are a nice item to have in your shelter category. Ground cloth can be used by your poncho that we talked about earlier or the plastic lining. That's an important element to put underneath your tent or your sleeping area so that you stay dry. Anytime you put your body completely flat against the ground, it sucks the heat from your body. When I was doing recovery operations in Japan, I found that I got really cold and I got somewhat sick at the end of the couple weeks because I was on a wet ground all day long looking for bodies or recovering bodies in debris. And my lungs got congested, and it was all because of that wet ground sucking the energy out of my body. That's why we put a barrier between us and our bodies when we sleep on the ground. So let's get into clothing now, which is, uh, again, another one of the key categories that we've, we need to have inside of any of our 
essential kits. Clothing is real basic and is broken down into three specific layers. The base layer, or the ender layer, is one that should wick away sweat off of our skin. Normally that's made from polypropylene, or silk, or some other synthetic fiber that does not retain water, but pulls it away from the body. This provides a very essential element called convection off the body. It pulls moisture away, and moisture, when it comes out of our body in the form of sweat, it's used, of course, to regulate the heat of our body and to keep us healthy and to keep us able to move and function and do the things we need to do. If we take too much water and it doesn't get wicked away and it's cold, it can freeze against our skin and cause hypothermia. If we are not able to ventilate the water, um, it can also cause us to overheat and get heat stroke. So it's important to have a breathable base layer. And then we move to the middle layer, which is the insulating layer. This is the layer that retains body heat to protect us from the cold. It also has to be breathable. The best stuff that I have seen out there is fleece, polyester fleece. It comes in about three different thicknesses, 100, 200, and 300. And depending on your body type and how much you get cold or hot, you need to adjust the one that you carry or have based upon that. I tend to burn real hot because I'm a big guy, so I use a lighter fleece normally in my middle layer. Unless I'm in an Arctic-type environment, then of course I need the thicker layer to maintain my warmth. The outer layer, or the third layer, is the barrier to the outside elements. And sometimes people use trash bags, which is a nice expedient outer layer in the event of a downpour of rain and you're caught in the middle of nowhere. And that's not a bad solution. You can get outer layers now that don't have to be high-end Gore-Tex three dollars $400 jackets. You can get outer layers that cost under $100 now that'll provide as much of the protection as any of the most expensive brands and, and types of materials out there. But the outer layer should again be breathable. And the way it normally works with technology the way it is right now is that the stitching of the outer layers materials allow your skin to breathe, but they're tight enough to prevent water and wind to get into your skin. As we need to ventilate or cool our body, we can remove the outer layer all the way down to the base layer if needed. And if we get cold, we add layers until our body gets regulated correctly again. One of the things I would consider in your outer layer is to have armpit zips. This allows you to extend the zipper from the armpit down to maybe the elbow and ventilate Again, displacing heat. The bottom line and the principle that underlies all of these layers is breathability. Our body has to have the ability to ventilate or to contain heat to keep us warm. To ventilate to cool or to contain heat to keep us warm. So let's move into the first aid kit. There's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of stuff you could buy. My first aid kit is built upon trauma. It also has some comfort items, such as band-aids for kids or yourself, um, some basic fundamental antiseptic, uh, which is important to clean wounds. So I'm gonna, I'll give you the list real quick. This list, along with all the other lists we're going to go over here, can be found at davidburnell.com. D-A-V-I-D-B-U-R-N-E-L-L.com. They're able to be downloaded for free there, and they're really helpful to be able to create your checklist to make sure that you have at least the basics. So band-aids of various sizes are nice, uh, small ones, big ones, but four by four pads are probably one of the most fundamental important things to have. The other thing that's critical to have is medical tape. Medical tape is the kind of tape that allows you to attach the four by four pad or the gauze, which is the third item, gauze, a roll of gauze. A roll of gauze can be used for individual wounds, can provide some compression and pressure on deep wounds as we close them and then have to wrap it, and are, is a very essential item. A blood clotting agent, they've gone from kind of quick clot to Celex, any one of those that allows you to quickly clot a gunshot wound, a traumatic injury is really important, especially in a disaster environment because EMS or 911 is going to be very busy. 
So your ability to mitigate the risk and to stop the bleeding is going to be critical in a disaster environment. A tourniquet. There's two types that I recommend, and I carry both. One is called a SWAT-T, for like tango, and it's a very wonderful tourniquet that has been designed by a former army ranger who was blown up in Afghanistan and has saved many lives by his invention. The second tourniquet is the CAT tourniquet, which is the one that the military and law enforcement often use. You know, medics carry these, and it provides full occlusion of the blood from the extremity by torque. You just have to Google CAT, C-A-T, tourniquet, and you'll see those online. Needles are important to have for closing wounds, uh, many other aspects of survival as well as first aid. A lighter in my first aid kit, I always have one so I can sanitize my needles or safety pins, which is another item. Safety pins, again, can be used to close large wounds. A light, a small flashlight, an LED light inside my first aid kit so I can see things at night. And especially when somebody's severely bleeding, it's important at night. It's kind of hard to see things anyway. It's great to be able to illuminate what's going on. And a light that you can fit in your mouth. So while you're working on a victim, you could actually put it in your mouth and hold it with your mouth while you work with your hands. Airway aids are important. If you can get a barrier between your mouth and somebody else's for CPR, that's a really important thing to have. Aspirins, antihistamines, antiseptic wipes, triple antibiotic ointment, Tweezers are the other items that I would have inside my first aid kit. Now we get down to the big list. This is the big list of the essentials. These are the items that would go into the core part of your 72-hour kit. And I'm just going to read them out real quick and make some comments if we haven't already talked about it on each item. So in the tools category, field knife, small axe, multi-tool, small shovel, and a small saw. The field knife should be something that has what's called a full tang, which means the metal goes all the way from the bottom of the knife all the way to the blade, and it's all one piece of metal. The company that I like to carry is Topps Knives. I also have a Browning field knife. I have a couple Gerbers. Gerber knives tend to me to be a little softer in the metal. I like to have a harder steel for my field knife. I would also include a pocket knife. Another device that we'd want to have would be the multi-tool, as we stated. And the multi-tool might replace your pocket knife, and it has all the other accessories that you might need, including a screwdriver. A small saw might be used, again, for building fires, shelters. I have one that's about a foot long when it folds out, and it's phenomenal for the field. Small shovel, sanitation. Digging a hole, perhaps even leveling ground. Lots of uses for a small shovel. Flashlights, illumination. I recommend you carry at least three sources of light. LED. LED is immune to being broken by being banged against a rock. The LED lights last a long time on battery juice, and they're very, very reliable in wet conditions. I would recommend a headlamp. A headlamp, and I would store the batteries on every digital or electronic device that I have outside of the device itself. Sometimes our kits are not used or looked at for a long time, and the batteries will corrode inside the headlamp or your flashlights unless they're removed and stored separately. And then when you need them, you get them out of your bag, you put them in, and you've got a light that works with no corrosion. Another source of light is emergency candles. Those can also be used if you get the type that have the mosquito irritant. It can be used to make sure mosquitoes don't get too friendly where you are. You know, there's a light that I like to recommend, and it's made by a company called Life Gear, L-I-F-E-G-E-A-R. And they're a little light that has an emergency whistle built in. It has five light modes, and it's like a glow stick that has a lot of different light functions. And I carry three or four of those in my go bag, so I might be able to give them to other people. And the battery life on those is ridiculously like 100 hours. Duct tape. I'd carry a whole roll in my go bag. 200 feet of paracord. We talked about that in the survival kit. 100 yards at least of fishing line. A fire starter kit with fuel, like stuff that will burn when it's wet and quickly. Lots of stuff available on the market. Flint and magnesium fire starter. I would always have that in my kit. I treat fire starting a lot like lights, having three light sources and three different ways to start fires. 
So a fire starting kit, like a flint and magnesium starter, a match or a box of matches in a Ziploc bag to keep them dry, and also a magnifying glass might be an option, and a lighter. And we talked about the lighter earlier, making sure it's like a Bic style lighter. I carry a pack of about four of those in my go bag. A metal mug and a spoon can be used for pretty much everything. A spoon will do everything a fork will do. And if you do need to cut something, you've got your field knife. And the metal spoon being a larger spoon is really a wonderful all around tool because you could actually dig with it as well. The metal mug can be put on a little stove, which I also recommend you have, a little fold out stove with a little bit of sterno. Sterno is a fuel source that allows you to warm up hot chocolate, uh, whatever else you might want to cook on top of your little fold out oven. It's a great solution. Another thing in your fire starter kit that you might want to have, again, is matches, keeping them in a waterproof Ziploc bag or other waterproof container. Some tinder, and again, all the essential elements that would allow making a fire in a not so dry environment or an austere environment a little bit easier. Space blankets, ponchos, rain jacket, trash bags, again, kind of blending into the clothing area, becoming something that you wear as a shelter to put a barrier between you and the elements. Ziploc bags. I take a bunch of Ziploc bags and stuff them in my go bag in case I might need those down the road for other items. Uh, your soap, once you open it up and break it out, sometimes putting it in a Ziploc bag is a good thing to do so that it doesn't muck up all your other gear. Toilet paper. Don't assume you're going to have any. Take a roll, put it in a big, large Ziploc bag, take all the air out of it, compress it, and it could be worth its weight in gold. Microfiber towels are really essential. Microfiber material has been used to make a lot of couches and furniture lately, but the, pr the product, when it's turned into a towel, makes a phenomenal blanket for warmth and a way to dry off really quickly without having a lot of water stored in the product itself. It can be wrung out by hand and dried very rapidly. I've used those in every mission and every place I've ever been, and it's one of my key essential items. Mine are about two to three by three feet in size they're quite large because I might use it as like a shawl and again a ground cloth or as a towel. Sanitizer, hand soap, dish soap. Emergency non-perishable food rations we talked about, large tarp or thick plastic, rescue signals. So there's a panel out there the military uses called a VS-17 panel. It's pink on one side and orange on the other. It's used to lay out flat to signal aircraft. Something like that that's high profile in color uh, you can buy cheap, inexpensive workers' vests that can be stored in your go bag and be worn. Again, in a rescue environment or a disaster environment, it's important to be seen, not to hide with camouflage, but to be seen and illuminated. Glow sticks and whistle uh, for rescuing. Glow sticks are the ones that you can buy that you break in half and they last for 8 to 12 hours. Those can also be used with 550 cord uh, tied to the end of them and spun around in the air at night to signal aircraft or other people. They can be seen from large distances. Often LED lights, glow sticks, can be seen for miles at night. Signaling mirror is a, is a good item to have for not only signaling aircraft, but also for looking inside the mirror and shaving. <laughs> Battery powered or hand crank radio. Uh, the radios that have the NOAA, the, the National Weather Radio, a station uh, with tone alert is a nice item to have. The hand crank so you don't need external power or if you don't have batteries. And that'll alert you if there's any other weather conditions that you might need to know of. Flashlights again, LED style. 100 yards of fishing line we talked about. Um, gloves, leather. Um, those are important to put in your go bag, especially if you're in an environment that's been turned upside down. Dusk masks for helping to filter contaminated air. Wet wipes, one of my favorite items, and many of the places I've been, I've used wet wipes as my method for sanitation and for showers and baths. It has been the only thing that I've had. And when you have a wet wipe bath, life is grand, especially after being mucky for a few days or weeks. Garbage bags, real thick ones, I would go for the higher quality ones. And plastic ties for with smaller trash bags for personal sanitation could be an option. Can opener for food. The little John Wayne can openers are also helpful. They're very small to store and they can fit in an actual survival kit. Solar chargers or adapters. A hand crank light with the solar chargers sometimes is an option. So a lot of the products you can get now will have a built-in solar charger, so that's another consideration. I would put a couple two-way radios 
inside my go bag, just regular old talk about radios, Motorola, third party, it doesn't matter. But I would also, again, remember to st store the batteries separate from the radios because they might corrode if they're stored inside the radios. Local maps of your area, another important item. I have topographical maps and I'm also storing city maps. Both are good to have. Cell phone with chargers and a battery backup solution or a solar solution would also be important. So some optional items that you might want to consider. Prescription medications, non-prescription medications, such as pain relievers, anti-diarrhea medication, anti-acids or laxatives, aspirin, ibuprofen, whatever you think is necessary. Glasses and contacts lens, solution, instant formula for babies, bottles, diapers, wipes, diaper rash cream, pet food, extra water for your pet, cash, traveler's checks, options. Import your family documents to be saved electronically or in a waterproof portable container. I think one of the things that's important is immunization records. Make sure you have a copy of those in case you do get treated by a physician. And you'll at least know what shots you've had. Sleeping bag or warm blanket for each person. Uh, I talked about that earlier. I think the sleeping bag is essential. Wool blankets are also essential. Complete change of clothing appropriate for your climate and sturdy shoes. Comfortable sturdy shoes. Household chlorine or bleach. And medicine dropper to disinfect water is another option for water purification. Feminine supplies and personal hygiene items. A tin plate, a tin cup, and again, a metal spoon are more optional items that I actually have in the essentials category. But sometimes people might think those are more optional than they really should be. Paper and pencil. I have a notebook called Write in the Rain. It actually can be written on when it's wet. And it's really great for taking into the field to take notes. Comfort items, books, games, puzzles, or other activities for children, a deck of cards, dice. A lot of fun games can be done with a deck of cards or a pair of ice. So as we wrap this podcast up, first I want to thank you for coming to the Velvet Hammer. And I want to extend my appreciation to you for, for listening. As you prepare your kits, whether it's your everyday carry, or it's your car kit, or it's your 72-hour kit or go bag, Keep it stored in a dry, cool environment where you can access it. Consider the location relative to a disaster. If it's in the basement and your house collapses, it's probably not as easy to get to as if it were in your garage on a shelf. Stored boxed food or, uh, or any of those types of perishable items or food items that have a life sh shelf life on them, uh, in closed plastic or me uh, metal containers, and in a cool, dry place as well. Replace expired items as needed. Find a time annually to review your kit and to update items and again, or replace them, including batteries and medications. I hope that as you prepare your kits, some of these things might be beneficial to you. And again, remember, you don't have to spend a ton of money to do this. You can piecemeal this together over time. But whatever you have, put it in a bag if you need to relocate from where you are to an alternate location. This is Dave Burnell, the Velvet Hammer Podcast. Out.